Swan's Way, Cambrai 2, Part 4, In Search of Lost Time, Volume 1, by Marcel Proust. Next to the central belief, which, while I was reading, produced constant movements from my inner self to the outer world, toward the discovery of truth, came the emotions aroused in me by the action in which I would be taking part. For those afternoons were crammed with more dramatic events than occur often in a whole lifetime. These were the events that took place in the book I was reading. It is true that the characters affected by them were not what Francoise would have called real, but none of the feelings that the joys or misfortunes of a real person awaken in us can be awakened except through a mental picture of those joys or misfortunes. And the ingenuity of the first novelist lay in his understanding that in the complicated structure of our emotions, the image being the one essential element, the simplification of which consisted in the suppression pure and simple of real people would be a decided improvement. A real person, profoundly as we may sympathize with him, is in a great measure perceptible only through our senses. That is to say, he remains opaque, offers a dead weight that our sensibilities have not the strength to lift. If some misfortune comes to him, it is only in one small section of the complete idea we have of him that we are capable of feeling any emotion. What is more, it is only in one small section of the complete idea he has of himself that he is capable of feeling any emotion either. The novelist's happy discovery was to think of replacing those parts impenetrable by the human spirit with the same quality of immaterial things, that is, with the spirit that can assimilate to itself after which it matters not that the actions, the feelings of this new order of creatures appear to us as real, since we have made them our own, since it is in ourselves that they are happening, that they are holding in a thrall while we turn feverishly the pages of the book, our quickened breath and staring eyes. At once the novelist has brought us to that state in which, as in all purely mental states, every emotion is multiplied tenfold, into which his book comes to disturb us as might a dream, but a dream more lucid and of a more lasting impression than those that came to us in sleep. And so, for the space of an hour, he sets free within us all the joys and sorrows in the world, a few of which only we would have to spend years of our actual life in getting to know, and the most intense of which would never have been revealed to us, because the slow course of their development suppresses our perception of them. It is the same in life. The heart changes, and that is our worst misfortune, but we learn of it only from reading by or by imagination, for in reality it changes like certain natural phenomena so gradually that even if we are able to distinguish successively each of its different states, we are still spared the actual sensation of the change. Next to, but in a distinctly less intimate part of myself than the lives of the characters, would come the view more or less projected before my eyes of the country in which the action of the story was taking place, which made a far stronger impression on my mind than the other. The actual landscape that would meet my eyes when I raised them from my book. In this way, for two consecutive summers, in the heat of the Cambrai garden, I was homesick for a land of mountains and rivers where I could see a number of sawmills where beneath the limpid currents fragments of wood lay rotting in beds of watercress and nearby rambling and clustering along low walls violet and red flowers. And since the dream of a woman who would love me was always present in my mind during those two summers the dream was permeated with the freshness and coolness of running water and whoever the woman might be 
whose image I call to mind. Clusters of violet and red flowers would at once spring up on either side of her, like complementary colors. This was not only because an image of which we dream remains forever distinguished, is adorned and enriched by the association of colors, not its own which may happen to surround in it our reverie, for the landscapes in the books I read were to me not merely scenery, more vividly portrayed by my imagination than any which Cambrai could spread before my eyes, but otherwise of the same kind. Because of the selection that the author had made of them, because of the spirit of faith in which my mind would anticipate and exceed his printed word, as it might be interpreting a revelation, these scenes used to give me the impression one that I hardly ever derived from any place where I happened to be, and never from our garden, that undistinguished product of the strictly conventional fantasy of the gardener, whom my grandmother so despised, of there being a veritable part of nature herself, and worthy to be studied and thoroughly explored. Had my parents allowed me, when I read a book, to pay a visit to the region it described, I would have felt that I was making an enormous advance toward the ultimate conquest of truth. For even if we have the sensation of being surrounded by our own soul, still it does not seem an immobile prison. Rather do we seem to be borne away with it in a perpetual struggle, to pass beyond it, to break out into the world with a kind of discouragement, hearing endlessly all around us that unvarying sound, which is no echo from without, but the resonance of a vibration from within. We try to find again in things, cherished by us on that account, the reflection that our soul has cast on them. We are disillusioned on ascertaining that they seem to be devoid of the charm which they owed in our minds to the association of certain ideas. Sometimes we convert all our spiritual forces into cleverness, into brilliance so as to influence other human beings who, as we very well know, are situated outside ourselves, where we can never reach them. And so, if I always imagined the woman I loved as surrounded by the places I then most longed to visit, if I wanted her to be the one who guided me there, who opened me, to me, the gate of an unknown world, that was not by the mere chance of a simple association of thoughts. No, it was because my dreams of travel and of love were only moments, which I isolate artificially today, as though I were cutting sections at different heights in a jet of water, iridescent but seemingly immobile, in a single and undeviating rush of all the forces of my life. And then, as I continue to trace the outward course of these impressions, simultaneously juxtaposed in my consciousness, and before I come to the real horizon that envelopes them, I discover pleasures of another kind, that of being seated, of tasting the good scent of the air, of not being disturbed by any visitor. And when an hour chimed from the steeple of saint Hilaire of watching what was already spent of the afternoon fall drop by drop until I heard the last stroke that enabled me to add up the total sum, after which the silence that followed seemed to herald the beginning in the blue sky above me of all that part of day still allowed for me, for reading, until the good dinner that Francoise was even now preparing and that would strengthen and refresh me after the strenuous pursuit of its hero through the pages of my book. And as each hour struck, it would seem to me that a few seconds only had passed since the hour before. The latest would inscribe itself close to its predecessor on the sky's surface. I could not believe that sixty minutes could be squeezed into the tiny arc of blue that was comprised between their two golden figures. Sometimes it would have even happened that this precocious hour would sound two strokes more than the last. There must have been an hour that I had not heard strike. Something that had gone, taken place, had not taken place for me. The fascination of my book 
A magic as potent as the deepest slumber had stopped my enchanted ears and had obliterated the sound of that golden bell from the azure surface of the enveloping silence. Beautiful Sunday afternoons beneath the chestnut tree in our Cambrai garden, from which I was careful to eliminate every commonplace incident of my actual existence, replacing them by a life of strange adventures and ambitions in the heart of a land watered by living streams. You still evoke for me that life when I think of you, and you embody it by virtue of having little by little drawn around and enclosed it, while I went on with my book, and the heat of the day declined, in the gradual crystallization, slowly altering in form and dappled with the foliage of your silent, sonorous, fragrant, limpid hours. Sometimes I would be torn from my book, in the middle of the afternoon by the gardener's daughter, who came running like a mad thing, overturning as she rushed by an orange tree in its tub, cutting a finger, breaking a tooth, and screaming out, They're coming, they're coming, so that Francoise and I would run too, and not miss anything of the show. That was on days when the cavalry garrisoned in Combray, and went out on maneuvers, going as a rule by the Rue saint Hildegarde, while well, our servants, sitting in a row on their chairs outside the garden fence, stared at the people of Cambrai taking their Sunday walks and were stared at in return. The gardener's daughter, through the gap between two houses far away in the Avenue de la Guerre, would have spied the glitter of helmets. The servants then hurried to bring in their chairs, for when the curiosaires filed through the Saint Hildegard, they filled it from side to side, and their jostling horses scraped against the walls of the houses, covering the submerged pavements like river banks that offer too narrow a bed to a torrent unleashed. Poor children, Francoise would exclaim, in tears almost, before she had reached the fence. Poor boys, to be mown down like grass in a meadow. Just thinking of it shocks me. She would go on, laying a hand over her heart, where presumably she had felt the shock. A fine sight, isn't it, Mademoiselle Francoise? All these young fellows who care nothing for their lives. The gardener would ask just to get a rise out of her he would not have spoken in vain. Not caring for their lives? Why, what in the world is there that we should care for if it's not our lives? The only gift the Lord never offers us a second time. Alas, dear God, you're right, all the same, it's quite true. They don't care. I saw them in 70. In those wretched wars, they've no fear of death left in them. They're nothing more or less than madmen. And then they aren't worth the price of a rope to hang them with. They're not men anymore. They're lions. For Francoise, to compare a man with a lion, which she pronounced lie-on, was not at all complimentary. The Rue saint de garde turned too abruptly for us to be able to see people approaching from afar and it was only through the gap between the two houses in the Avenue de la Guerre that we could still make out new helmets racing toward us and flashing in the sunlight. The gardener wanted to know whether there were still many to come because he was thirsty, with the sun beating down. Then suddenly his daughter would leap out, as though from a besieged city, would make a sortie, turn the street corner, and having risked her life a hundred times over, reappear and bring us with a carafe of licorice water, the news that there were still at least a thousand of them coming along without a break from the direction of Tiversy and Mesglise. Francoise and the gardener, having made up their differences, would discuss how they would conduct themselves in case of war. Don't you see, Francoise, the gardener would say, revolution would be better, because then no one would need to join in unless he liked. Oh yes, I can see that, certainly. It's more straightforward. 
The gardener believed that as soon as war was declared, they would stop all the railways. Yes, to be sure, so that they won't get away, said Francoise. And the gardener would assent with an, aye, they're the cunning ones, for he would not allow that war was anything but a kind of trick which the state attempted to play on the people, or that there was a man in the world who would not run away from it if he had the chance to do so. But Francoise would hate sin back to my aunt, and I would return to my book, and the servants would take their places again outside the gate to watch the dust settle on the pavement and the excitement caused by the passage of the soldiers subside. Long after the order had been restored, an abnormal tide of humanity would continue to darken the streets of Combray. And in front of every house, even of those where it was not as a rule done, the servants and sometimes even the masters would sit and stare festooning their doorsteps with a dark, irregular fringe, like the border of seaweed and shells that a stronger tide than usual leaves on the beach, as though trimming it with embroidered crepe, when the sea itself had retreated. Except on such days as these, however, I would as a rule be left to read in peace, but the interruption that a visit from Swan once made, and the commentary that he then supplied to the course of my reading, which had brought me to the work of an author quite new to me, Burgot, had this result that for a long time afterward it was not against a wall adorned with clusters of violet flowers, but on a wholly different background, the porch of a Gothic cathedral, that I would see outlined the image of one of the women of whom I dreamed.